This week we're going to look at the liquify tool. It's one of the few tools in Darktable which allows you to physically manipulate the position of pixels within your image. To be honest, it's not a tool I have a common use for, but occasionally it comes in handy. Let's dive on in. Hi, and welcome to episode 43 of Understanding Darktable. As promised, we're going to look at the Liquify tool. Now, as I said in the intro, I don't use this very often. I think in the three years that I've been mucking around with Darktable, I've maybe used this on two images, and we will get to one of those images later in this episode. For now, we are going to start with a boring image of a wall. And the reason I've done this is because we've got some vertical lines and we've got some horizontal lines, and these will act as great indicators of exactly what the Liquify tool is doing. So you'll find the Liquify tool in the correction group. And as you can see, what we've got is a point tool, a line tool, and a curve tool. So we're going to start with the point tool. And what we get is this yellow circle with a control point in the middle and a line extending out at some arbitrary angle with an arrowhead on the end. We left click and that creates our point node to distort our image. Now, as you can see, all of the distortion is occurring inside the circle. If we want to make that circle smaller or larger, we can grab this node, which by default starts at the three o'clock position, but you can move it. But where you move it to has no bearing on what the tool does. So it starts at the three o'clock position. By dragging this in or out, we can change the size of the area of the pixels being distorted. So if we make it larger, there are more pixels being distorted than if we make it smaller. You've then got this control line with an arrowhead on the end of it. We can left click that arrowhead and drag it in or out and around in any angle that we want. How close to the center we set that arrowhead will reduce the intensity of the distortion. As we drag it further from the center point, the distortion becomes more intense. And like I said, you can also set the angle simply by dragging the arrowhead with your mouse. So that's the basics of the point node. Like all mask editing in Darktable, if you want to remove this, you can simply right click and the image will reset. Now, I will confess that in my testing, this didn't always work. Sometimes I would right click on a thing that I'd drawn and although it would disappear, the effect would remain on the image. So we may see that later in the video. Okay, the line tool. Again, we've got the same cursor if you like to begin with but to draw a line is a three click process it's left click to start move your mouse left click to place an end point and then right click to close it off so now we've got two control circles joined by a straight line and as we saw with the point node tool, we have the control arrow, which allows us to change the direction of the distortion. We've got this node on the outer circle, which allows us to change the size of that circle. So you can do some pretty complicated things with distortion paths. But like I said, I'm not sure how often you're going to need to use this. But how you use it? That's entirely up to you. I'm just here to tell you how it works. So we can change the size of the circle. We can change the direction of the arrows. And you can do the same on the other end of the circle. And you can create some very funky effects. Now, I just want to come back to... There we go. Okay, so as you saw, I right-clicked on that segment to get rid of that particular path and it got rid of the path but it didn't actually get rid of the effect so i click on the 
reset for the tool and that's got me back to an unaltered image. Now I just want to go back to the straight line. We can make a multi-line path if we want to. So it's left click, left click, move again, left click, move again, left click. And if we now wanted to close that off, we could just right click. And now we've got a three line path. And, you know, we can go and do all sorts of funky things with all of these control arrows and decide what it is that we want to distort and how. And like I said, why you'd want to do it, I don't know. Okay, let's just have a quick look at the curve tool before we get on to some of the more complex stuff. If you didn't think it was complex enough already. Okay, so moving on to the curved line segment. Let's go left click, left click, left click, right click. So now we've got a curved segment defined by two endpoints and one center point. Again, we can control the size of each of these individually by controlling the size of the circle with this node on the outside. We can control the angle of the distortion with these arrowheads and how far we drag them. But this is where it gets really funky. If we mouse over this middle node control point, we can see that it's a circle by default. And that is what's called auto smooth mode. If you look up the top, you can see it says control click, auto smooth, cusp, smooth, symmetrical. So when that icon in the middle of the circle is itself a circle, we are in auto smooth mode. And what that means is that the row of yellow arrowheads along this curve here will always be a smooth Bezier curve. If we control click this icon, we get two Bezier curve control handles and we can adjust them independently. Now, if you've ever done any photo manipulation in Photoshop, in GIMP, or if you've worked in 2D stuff like Inkspace or Illustrator, you would already be familiar with this idea of control handles for Bezier curves that allow you to shape paths. So as you can see, we are now in cusp mode and we're not now having a completely smooth curve along all of these yellow arrowheads. We are changing the shape of that curve by the way we drag these Bezier control handles. If we control click it, oh, and by the way, you will notice that that center icon changed from a circle to a triangle. So that tells you you're in cusp mode. If we control click that again, it changes to a diamond. Now we are in smooth mode. And what it means is that the two Bezier control handles will always form a straight line, but you can change the length of one side as opposed to the length of the other side, right? So they, they change length independently, but they always form a straight line so that the Bezier curve is always smooth. And finally, if we control click again, it turns into a square, which is symmetrical mode. And as you can probably guess, the moment we click on either handle, the opposite handle will match the angle and the length so that you can change both sides of the curve simultaneously. Okay, all of this is extraordinarily intense and I don't know how often anyone ever uses this stuff, but this is what it is. I'm just gonna reset the whole thing again because there is more to tell you. Okay, so we're gonna go back to the point node and we'll just introduce some basic distortion here, like so. Okay, what we haven't covered yet is feathering. By left clicking on the center node, we can introduce these two circles. And these allow us to control how the feathering effect is implemented on the distorted pixels. Now I will confess, I'm struggling with this a little bit. I think what happens 
is that anything in that inner circle is not being distorted a whole lot. Everything in this middle zone, if you like, between these two circles is getting distorted at 100%. And then anything which falls in between the second circle and the outer circle is feathering off from 100% distortion at the second circle to zero distortion at the outer circle. I think that's what's happening. If anyone can shed more light on that, please sing out in the comments down below. Love to hear from you. All right, so those are the basics. As with most other paths, things that should be covered here would include, I'm just going back to the line segment, we'll go left click, left click, left click, and right click. If you ever decide, I don't really need this node here, or maybe it's the one on the end, I don't need this anymore, you can simply control key and right click to remove a node. If you decide you need to add a node, you can simply mouse over the control line, hold down the control key and left click, and that will introduce a new node. And that will work on the straight line segments as well as on the curved segments. Okay, I think we made it through, I think. <laughs> like I said, I'm not a massive user of this tool and I will show you the one time that I have used it. I will just jump to my next image. This was a multi-image pano that I shot of St. Paul's Cathedral in London. And as you can see, because of the way my lens captured each of the frames, I think there were about five vertical frames in this pano, if I remember correctly. And it was shot with my 20 mil wide angle in, you know, five portrait orientation frames, which if you haven't ever shot panos, you should always shoot them in portrait mode. Don't shoot them landscape. That's a whole other video. And as you can see, what has happened there is that when Hugen patched those five images together, we've ended up with this sky information not really extending as far as I would have liked it to go. So what I could do is control and mouse wheel to zoom out from my image, come over here, grab the point tool, and I'll go stupidly large, and I will click there, and I will just do something like that. And then I'll grab another one, and I'll put it over here, drag that one off outside the frame in that direction. And that has now filled in the sky on this image. Now, we could come in close and you can kind of see that there's some visual distortion happening there, but it's clouds. And to be honest, anyone who's looking at this image is probably not focused on the clouds. So hopefully they're not going to notice it straight away. Probably if it was printed out, you know, eight feet wide on canvas and hanging on a big wall, people might sort of scan their eyes across the entire thing and suddenly go, oh, something's a bit weird in the corners there. But as a general rule, I think it does the job pretty well just for filling in that extra information in the corners. Now, like I said, there's, there's probably a, a thousand different ways that you could use the liquify tool. I have never used it for anything beyond just filling in corners of panoramas that have occasionally ended up with a similar type of thing where the sky information doesn't extend far enough for my liking. And in this instance, it was because of the top of the uh, spire, I guess you would call it, on the top of St. Paul's Cathedral that dictated the fact that I didn't want to crop the sky down from the top of the image. So I needed to fill in that information in the corners. So that's the only way that I've ever used it. If you've got other ways of using it, please, again, sing out in the comments. We'd love to hear other ways that you could use this tool. 
once again, I would love to say thank you to all my Patreon supporters, as well as to all of my subscribers here on YouTube. Uh, if you would like to support my efforts financially, that would be most appreciated. The link to my Patreon is in the description down below. And I think that just about does it for this episode. I will catch you in the next one.